Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Tonight on our news, the former DRA head sues the government for over $400,000. Should Parliament manage its own budget and affairs? Organizers of the Dex to Daps concert forging ahead without approval from health officials. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, the Davis administration has been hit with a $400,000 lawsuit by former managing director of the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, Catherine Smith. She accused the DRA of breach of contract and is seeking damages for the salary and allowances she would have received over the next two years had her contract not been terminated. Berthney McDermott reports. Former Disaster Reconstruction Authority Managing Director Kay Forbes Smith filed a lawsuit against the Davis administration claiming she's owed over $400,000 for breach of contract after being terminated last year. The writ of summons dated December 21, 2021, says Smith's employment contract that took effect December 3, 2019, was set to expire November 30, 2023. The contract states that the DRA agreed to pay Smith an annual salary of $110,000 in monthly installments of $9,166.66 and an annual housing allowance of $30,000 in monthly installments of $2,500. Additionally, she was also granted an annual duty allowance of $15,000 in monthly installments of $1,250 and a monthly fuel allowance of $250. Under the contract, she was also entitled to a 15% gratuity of the sum received under the contract. While the former Senate president is required to give a six-month termination notice, there were no provisions for the DRA to terminate the contract before its expiration. The recently served writ notes that the government terminated Smith's contract on or around September 29, 2021, which is in breach of the contract by way of a letter from the office of the Prime Minister. The writ says, by way of damages for the aforementioned breach, Ms. Smith is entitled to a contractual sum for termination of her employment in breach of contract in an amount equal to her salary and benefits for an unexpired term of the contract. That sum, $408,333.16. Smith claims she is owed 26 months worth of salary totaling $238,333.16, a housing allowance of $65,000, duty allowance of $32,500, fuel allowance of $6,500, and gratuity equaling $66,000. Forbes Smith is also seeking interest accrued from the date she received the letter from OPM, any additional relief the court may deem justified, and legal costs. Forbes Smith is a known member of the Free National Movement and headed the communications team in the run-up to the last election. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Meanwhile, organizers of a Valentine's Day reggae concert say the event is going ahead despite not having approval from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Jared Higgs tells us more. We up all night, speaking on the phone, but Bombers, NASA, February 11th. The fate of a popular concert up in the air, as its promoters say it's still on, but health officials say they haven't approved the event. This is regular. Text us live in Bahamas. You know what it is. Shellins. Fluid Factory is hosting the Dax Adapt shows on Friday, February 11th at the QE Sports Center in Nassau and on the 12th at Gombe Park in the International Bazaar in Freeport, Grand Bahama. Please, people, continue to buy your tickets. Don't be afraid. F Fluid Factory is here. If you don't know now, you know Dex Adapt concert this weekend. But the show's existence was thrown into limbo over the weekend after OPM Director of Communications, Latre Ramming, tweeted that the event's organizers hadn't been given approval for a Dax Adapt's concert to be held, nor had the Ministry of Health and Wellness received a request for approval. A statement today from Minister of Health and Wellness Dr. Michael Darville explained that a communication was sent on January 17, 2022 in response to a request for approval for a reggae Valentine event seeking to host 2,000 persons on February 11, 2022. The email advising the organizers that the event could only occur if it adhered to the existing parameters in the health services rules, 30 maximum outdoors and 20 maximum indoors. The denial was partly due to the state of the pandemic at the time, Darvel said, 
and the organizers were invited to resubmit a request for approval for reconsideration two weeks prior to the event. As of 10 a.m. this morning, February 7, 2022, the advisory committee of the Ministry of Health and Wellness was not in receipt of a resubmission of a request from the organizers for this event. Meanwhile, the event's promoter, Clayvon Duncan, appeared in a radio show telling listeners that the concert is still on. Everyone, I'm going to show you that the event will happen. Um, just be patient with us, uh, believe in us, and I'm here feeling kind of good. Our news attempted to contact the event's organizer several times by phone and WhatsApp to no avail. In their radio appearance, they suggest that approval for the concert will be granted. It's looking good, and this is why we know we would get the approval. Right. And we, the, the process, like I said, you get your approval the week of your event. So for someone to say on a Saturday, oh, we didn't get approved, they didn't say we got denied. Reporting for our news, I am Jared Higgs. In other news, senators today giving the green light for a resolution establishing a standing committee to determine if a new parliament should be built and what added resources are needed to help parliamentarians carry out their duties. The move comes eight years after a standing committee sparked public fury after recommending MPs get a salary increase. Jasmine Brown has that. Moving the resolution in the Senate this morning was leader of government business in the Senate, Michael Halkidis. He made a case for a committee by insisting there is general consensus that Parliament should manage its own budget and affairs. Parliament, inclusive of the House of Assembly and the Senate, uh, being independent, um, be allowed for the administration of their own budget so that they can be more nimble and move more quickly um, to um, secure the goods and services that they require. The resolution was taken up in the Senate two weeks after it made its way through the House of Assembly. Like in the House of Assembly, Halkita stressed the need for the committee to look at additional resources and funding for MPs and senators. And so do we look at increasing the amount of the capital allowance to allow members of parliament to do more things like um, small road repairs and other uh, repairs and developments within their uh, constituency? The reality is, Madam President, that some members of Parliament have more resources themselves or they can have access to more resources by virtue of their connections and, and who they are. And so that we do not, so that representation does not become or, or I, wouldn't, I don't want to say remain, so, so it, it is not a rich person's game. Last month, members of parliament supported the resolution that establishes a standing committee to determine if a new parliament should be constructed and to determine what support members of parliament and senators should be given to carry out their work. An interim report from a previous committee of the House in 2014 drew strong criticism. That select committee, chaired by the late Bernard Nottage, recommended the construction of a new House of Assembly and that the salaries for MPs and the deputy speaker be increased. Following the public furor over the issue, the recommendations were abandoned. These buildings were built between 1813 and 1815. That's 1813 and 1815, 200 years ago. The opposition supported the resolution. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Outgoing Free National Movement Chairman Carl Culmer revealing which candidate for chairman he'll be backing in the party's convention later this month. He sat down with Tanya Cartwright. In just a little over two weeks, members of the Free National Movement will come together for the party's national convention, paving the way forward with a new slate of party offices. The R News team had a sit down with the outgoing party chairman Carl Culmer who surprisingly endorsed one of the candidates for chairman, saying that man is clearly the best choice. You're putting me on the spot here, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I guess everyone knows that uh, I'm supporting um, Dr. Dwayne Sands. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at all of the um, uh, candidates um, for, for, for um, uh, chairman, um, he over the, over the years have been that person that FNMs can call. Um, they they, they um, can can um, uh, pick up the phone and call him. Um, he has assisted many many FNMs um, um, over over the, over the, over the. Um, he is not one to to shun away from um, uh, a phone call, you know. And, and and my thing is, we want a job done. Give it to a person who's busy. They will find the time 
to do what is required uh, for for the office. The contenders for party chairman were four at the beginning, with Dr. Dwayne Sands, Michael Folks, Ellsworth Johnson, and Colin Ingram all offering themselves for the top post. Since then, Ingram has dropped out, wanting to focus more on his demanding business, leaving the others all firmed up, promising to bring unity to the party. Kalmer set out what he thinks should be qualities found in a chairman. The chairmanship is not uh, just a camera and lights um, position. It's a position where in, you need to be able to help, and sometimes you need to put your hands in your pocket and assist um, persons, because not every time someone calls there's uh, available cash mm -hmm. for you. So uh, you need a, a chairperson who can, who can assist. Uh, you don't need a chairperson who's going to be um, running away from the form. You know, there's some folks who, who um, uh, run for office. Uh, during my, my, my tenure as chairman, I could not even get them. There you have it. Carl Kulma has endorsed Dwayne Sands for next chairman of the FNM. At the headquarters, this is Tanya Smith Cartwright for our news. Senate President Lachelle Adderley is calling for legislators to take immediate action and adopt a zero-tolerance approach to addressing gender-based violence. We need to cultivate a culture of zero-tolerance legislation and policies to combat these issues and to create a safer Bahamas, irrespective of race, class, creed, sex, or socioeconomic status. Clear conditions ahead. Meteorologist Greg Thompson has the latest in the Weather Center. Good evening, Greg. Thanks, Christina. Our first look at weather tonight is being brought to you by Ports International. Trusted medical supplies for a better quality of life. Comfortable conditions outside our studios tonight. Temperatures are in the low 70s, 73 degrees under mostly clear skies. We have some very light winds out there out of the east at 4 miles per hour. And your feels like temperature in the low 70s. Satellite view, ridge of high pressure dominating our weather at the surface. Weak boundary that was just to the north of the Bahamas has lifted towards the north. A couple isolated showers still hanging out, but we are watching a system in the Gulf of Mexico anticipated to get here by middle of the week so we could see some showers increase in our area by then. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still ahead, Crystal Cruz is on pause off Grand Bahama. We'll tell you why. And the state of a public cemetery sparks outrage. Find out more after this. Get that glorious internet connection back in business within seconds with the new self-help modem reset. Just follow these very easy steps. Step one, call 601-2200 or 242-300-2200. Number two, select option three. Step three, select option two. Step four, enter your eight digit account number. Step five, follow the prompts. It's really that simple. Rev, you and us together. Trouble on the high seas for luxury cruise line Crystal Cruises as the Crystal Serenity and Crystal Symphony were arrested in Bahamian waters over the weekend. Attorney General Ryan Pinder confirming the acting port controller would have taken out the actual arrest order on two Crystal Cruise Line vessels in accordance with maritime law. However, he made clear that the issue stems from a private action between two parties. It appears to be a private matter between uh, Crystal Cruises, who are um, a debtor, uh, from what I understand, under certain amounts owed for fuel for their, their, their ships. And there was litigation in uh, the United States over the matter. Over the weekend, international media outlets reported that two of Crystal Cruise Line's vessels were held up in waters just off Freeport due to non-payment of fuel. Crew on board one of the ships took to Twitter, sharing this message from the cruise liner's captain. Uh, the ship has been placed under arrest by the local authorities uh, over some unpaid bills. The Miami Herald is reporting those unpaid bills equal $3.4 million. And as ships registered in the Bahamas, the vessels fall under Bahamian maritime law. It does put the Bahamas in a, in a unique situation in that um, the ships are, are, are flagged in the Bahamas. The ships were physically present in the Bahamas when arrested. And uh, according to uh, the statute, the acting port controller is the marshal um, when an arrest order is made. 
In other news, a sad state of a public cemetery on Cowpen Road is sparking outrage among grieving families who are calling on the government to address this issue. Sharika Johnson has more. It's really a disgrace and a, it's total disrespect for the families and who have been buried there. Um, it's, it's, it was amazing. I thought I was living some type of um, B-movie. Adding to a broken heart, relatives are aggrieved at the uncapped condition of the Southern Cemetery. William Wong attended the funeral of a friend killed in a hit-and-run accident. When he arrived with family at the Southern Graveyard, he was upset to find empty graves, collapsed pieces of wood and scribbled names written in cement on some graves. We need to show some more respect for what people when they died. When our news visited the cemetery today, we saw colic bottles, soda cans and trash thrown about the graves, overgrown empty holes and old cement bags in some holes. If the government is, is responsible, then they need, need to put the proper people in place to make sure that there's some type of order. You got four or five friends going at the same time. I'm, I'm, I'm in one. And next door, the people are screaming their head off in anguish. President of the Bahamas Funeral Directors Association, Kirch Ferguson, said government was on track to maintain public cemeteries, like the Southern Cemetery. But he thinks the resources are readily available to consistently manage them. He agreed that the graves are in a deplorable state. Persons are often seen practicing witchcraft and opening graves. He calls for personnel to be placed at the cemeteries to ensure upkeep. For our news. I'm Sharika Johnson. It's now time for tonight's Financial Market Minute, brought to you by RF, your local investment bank. This has been your Financial Market Minute. To explore the best performing mutual funds in the Bahamas, visit our website at www.rfgroup.com. When our news returns, how cable and its partners are helping families after loss, plus a local track meet almost sidelined. Stay with us. Get that glorious internet connection back in business within seconds with the new self-help modem reset. Just follow these very easy steps. Step one, call 601-2200 or 242-300-2200. Number two, select option three. Step three, select option two. Step four, enter your eight digit account number. Step five, follow the prompts. It's really that simple. Rev, you and us together. This is our news. Welcome back. Seven families will get a helping hand after battling the worst kind of loss during the COVID-19 pandemic. Berthony McDermott reports. The Cable Bahamas group of companies is partnering with local non-governmental organizations to assist seven families. Bahamas Harvest Church, Lowe's Wholesales Limited, Island Pay Limited, Coca-Cola and RF Bank raised $20,000 for the families. Among those being helped are children who lost their parents during the pandemic. Uh, we have 15 families who have been displaced where they've lost both father and mother, a total of, of well, seven families, a total of 15 children. And uh, oftentimes in situations like this, somebody has to step up to the plate to be the guardian. And the guardians that did, they responded with their heart, not counting the cost. And so now that reality has set in, it is an incredible relief to know that they're not doing it alone. Corporate partners have also committed to providing jobs to those children. The Hope for All Seasons initiative is an extension of the Hope for the Holidays campaign, launched in December 2021. Under the initiative, the families were provided Christmas trees, gifts, appliances, and electronics. CBL CEO Franklin Butler says it feels good to do good. Here at Kale Bahamas, I see it as our responsibility to really do more in the community, to give back and to have impact to those who are less privileged than ourselves. And it's really good when we have partners like Super Value who've now joined us as well as Pastor Mario at Bahamas Harvest Church and 
all of our friends here today. According to Bahamas Harvest Church senior pastor Mario Moxie, the money will be placed on island pay accounts and distributed to the families on a monthly basis. Butler says this is just the start of community initiatives to come. We'll be looking into those communities across the family islands to see what other things we can do to make sure that, you know, they too are not left out. I mean, the, the family islands have been incredibly supportive of what we've done on the Alive Network, and we're excited to be able to make our community giving not just New Providence-centric, but across the, the length and breadth of the Bahamas. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. In other news, a crucial local track meet marred by COVID restrictions before officials stepping in to allow young people to compete. Marcellus Hall has the details tonight in sports. Thanks a lot and welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. It was just recently that the Minister of Youth Sports and Culture, the Honorable Mario Boleg, said that track and field, amongst other sports, were now going to be allowed to continue. This past weekend, there was a meet on the schedule at the Thomas A. Robinson Stadium. Turns out not everybody got the memo. With the Carifta Games set to make their return after a two-year hiatus due to COVID-19, in April, track meets, in order for our athletes to qualify, have been few and far in between. In fact, they've been practically non-existent. This past weekend, the B3A Star Performance Time Trials were held at the Thomas A. Robinson Stadium, and things were going well with up to 400 athletes all on the track in various age groups looking to make those qualifying standards. That is, until COVID police arrived upon the scene saying that the meet would have to be suspended due to what they had been told were upwards of 2,500 people. Now, no word as yet as to where they got those numbers from, but needless to say, the news of suspension did not go over very well. We heard from star performer, star trackers, head coach, David Charlton, who expressed his disappointment at having the meet being held up. It is very disappointing. Like I said earlier, the, the, this meet and meets to come are very important because it gives these kids the opportunity to qualify to go to this year's Grifta Games in Jamaica. Uh, coaches, university coaches are at these meets with, I mean, money in their pocket. Looking, just give these kids money uh, in, in terms of a full scholarship and. For a number of our 12th graders, if they can't make the Carifta team, it's going to be very difficult for them now to, to get the kind of attention, to get the quality scholarship that they so much deserve. And they come out here every day and work hard for. Now, after about a 70-minute delay, at which point in time, calls were made to the Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, the Honorable Mario Boleg, as well as the Ministry of Health. Well, I wrote to the, well, I wrote to the Ministry. Well, I wrote to the Ministry. Cooler heads would prevail, and finally the meet would be able to resume, which allowed for a total of 10 Carifta qualifying times and throws to be made. So at the end of the day, the athletes were able to get it done, and certainly much well appreciated in terms of the government coming forward and making sure the event was being able to finish up. And everybody pleased at the end of the day, B3H president, Jamiko Archer. I think that um, the all entities, the police, the, the federation and the officials handle this issue masterfully. masterfully. Uh, I think it's just a matter of communication. The law is very clear about um, putting on sporting activities in the outdoor. And in this case, the B3As is a classic example of just how that should be done. The law provides that once you are fully vaccinated, you can carry out um, outdoor activity without the permission of the Ministry of Health. And there it is, your look at sports for you here on this Monday. I'm Marcellus Hall, back to you, Christina. Thanks, Marcellus. Still ahead, will sunny conditions continue tomorrow? Greg has the answer after this. Get that glorious internet connection back in business within seconds with the new self-help modem reset. Just follow these very easy steps. Step one, call 601-2200 or 242-300-2200. Number two, select option three. Step three, select option two. Step four, enter your eight digit account number. Step five, follow the prompts. It's really that simple. Rev, you and us together. Welcome back to our news. 
A mix of sunny and cloudy conditions this week. Greg is back with our extended forecast. Thanks again, Christine, and welcome everybody for our second look at weather on this beautiful Monday evening. High pressure ridge remains in charge of the weather across the islands, generating some breezy conditions across the southeastern islands. Weak boundary that was to the north of the Bahamas has lifted well to the north, and we're now watching a low pressure system in the Gulf of Mexico. That is going to move across Florida, and that low will intensify, in turn dragging in front across us by Wednesday, Thursday time frame, so we could see some showers in the forecast by then. And behind that, we expect a cool down as a high pressure system builds in behind that frontal boundary for the balance of the week. Boating forecast for the Northwest and Central Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Your winds will be out of the southeast at 10 to 15 knots. Seas running two to four feet over the ocean. High tide will be at 1.06 in the morning. For the Southeast Bahamas, caution flag posted for you guys down there. Winds will be east to southeast at 15 to 20 knots. Seas will be running a rough four to seven feet over the ocean. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Monday. That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe evening, everybody. Christina. Thanks, Greg, and thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Christina Dragovich. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.